Before we begin, this video is sponsored by Raycon. Halloween is here, and what better way to spook yourself silly than to immerse yourself in some top quality sounding scares. Whether you be cozied up on the sofa, jumping about in the gym, or simply outside soaking in the festive atmosphere. Raycon earbuds connect seamlessly to any Bluetooth device, and provide a comfortable lightweight fit thanks to their various optimized gel tips to ensure you get the best possible experience without any interference. I use Raycon earbuds literally every single day, such as when walking my good doggo Barney while listening to some last podcast on the left, the stressing with a good audiobook, or listening to music while reading Junji Ito after a long day. I've even started using their built-in microphone with the simple press of a button to take work calls for a new gig I have outside of YouTube instead of using one of those annoying mouthpiece things. Raycon earbuds offer 8 hours of playtime and a 32 hour battery life thanks to their compact charging case which also protects them from my clumsy damage prone ass, and if you find they're just not for you, Raycon offer a 45 day happiness guarantee. So starting at half the price of other premium audio brands without compromising on quality, click the link in the description box below or go to buyraycon.com slash Ryan to get 15% off your order. As I've gotten older, my perspective on the horror genre and cinema as a whole has greatly softened to the point I'm generally quite forgiving of most films I once held scathing opinions off. A large part of it was my gradual disconnect from the zeitgeist of wanting to be some respected intellectual art critic during my admittedly smug, arrogant student years, where I feel my negativity came from a place of wanting to outsmart everything to feed my own ego, rather than open-mindedly engaging with the honest intent behind, uh, lesser quality films, shall we say. Now, that's not to suggest being a negative critic is inherently bad, god forbid anyone has an opinion these days. Hell, I have many issues with the film I'm about to discuss, but at the end of the day, I pick apart films and dig ridiculously deep into them because, well, it's just a bit of fun, and to have it any other way would be frankly exhausting. For every critic who can nitpick a film apart, I like to think there's people out there who can equally nitpick a film back together. That's why I want to go back to the 2007 remake of Halloween, along with its 2009 remake, written and directed by the cult-followed heavy metal singer and filmmaker Rob Zombie. I used to loathe this remake for the sole reason I once believed that the unspoken rule to film criticism was to disregard remakes as universally bad and narrowly sought to solely compare them negatively to the original, especially when it was a beloved behemoth like Hallow Fucking Ween. However, I guess there's no better way to demonstrate how my outlook has changed than exploring a reimagining that ambitiously and overindulgently attempted to go far beyond the basic premise of John Carpenter and Deborah Hill's 1978 masterpiece. While a retrospectively significant film that helped popularize the slasher genre, like with many of Carpenter's films, Halloween was initially received with indifference. The LA Times perfectly summarized the consensus as a well-made but empty and morbid thriller, yet many would still concede that that was kind of the point. I know I'll get torn apart for saying this, but Halloween itself was a derivative film that wasn't much different from Black Christmas or The Town That Dreaded Sundown, which predated Carpenter's suspense techniques and nihilistic ambiguity. The true foundation of its legacy, the one masterful exception, was the fiercely alluring mystique of its iconic killer Michael Myers, who is credited simply as The Shape. Both Carpenter and Hill wrote Myers to be, in the words of Michael's psychiatrist Dr. Samuel Loomis, pure evil. There was no man behind the mask, no humanity or soul, just a dark void of violence leaving a trail of death and destruction. Before the sequels introduced the Thorn Cult to explain Michael's cursed inability to die, whether or not he was supernatural was open to interpretation. In the original, he still had human qualities like physically reacting to pain or driving a car despite being institutionalized since he was a kid, but it was all sold in how Loomis hyped him up, alongside his eerie presence and uncanny stretched out William Shatner mask, which made him look and feel enigmatic and unnatural. 
So, with that context established, five years after the ultimate showdown between Michael Myers and Busta Rhymes, along came Rob Zombie to unravel that powerful mystique by diving into the mind of Michael Myers and applying a psychological edge that very understandably polarised both critics and fans alike. As we explore both films, because they're better viewed as a collective two-parter, make sure to leave your thoughts in the comments below, and now let's enter the bold and perplexing world of Rob Zombie's Halloween. So, it actually just occurred to me that I have never covered a Rob Zombie film, so to share my general thoughts on his work, I have largely mixed feelings about him because he just isn't really my style. From the several interviews I've seen of him, along with his Tarantino-esque aesthetic, he's certainly a technically competent filmmaker with a distinct voice and a keen variety of unconventional influences. But if you can't get into something like an ugly exploitation western called The Devil's Rejects, about three irredeemable murderous psychopaths on a road to hell, uh, you're definitely not going to like his other films. He is pretty interesting from the perspective of how he creates these grotesquely zany, eccentric, and even sometimes morally complex villains that feel humanised more so by their charismatic actors than the quality of the writing itself, which I feel is definitely the weakest aspect of his work. Again, this is fairly subjective because his writing has a kind of edgy deviant grit to it that works well for his grindhouse style, but it doesn't entirely translate into a clean, ordinary suburban setting like Halloween. If anything, Zombie would have been better doing a Texas Chainsaw or Last House on the Left remake rather than Halloween, because while he kneels the utter brutality of Michael Myers, he just doesn't have the subtlety or sensitivity to develop innocent characters as we'll come to see. Now, while Zombie did obtain John Carpenter's blessing, Carpenter later stated at the New York Film Academy that he wasn't entirely happy with Zombie's fundamental misunderstanding of maintaining the core mystery which by that point had been long spoiled by the now retcon sequels. At the same time, as Carpenter supportively said to him, this is Rob Zombie's Halloween, not John Carpenter's Halloween. That still exists and remains untampered with, so we have to put our egos aside and not let those feelings get in the way of experiencing a version that still admirably tries to do more than the average cash grab remake. Put it this way, if this was a carbon copy of Carpenter's version, people would still be condemning it as being a pointless derivative, so it's a lose-lose situation regardless. While the remake is obviously not perfect, it's long-winded and dull in places, and I will always prefer the original short and sweet simplicity, as a slasher flick, it still succeeds in the ultimate goal of renewing Myers as a brooding and barbaric force of evil after being diluted by the various sequels. Here's the thing, if you remove the first 30 minutes of the almost two hour runtime, it's pretty much the same structure, except in how it significantly reshapes Michael along with our two main protagonists, Laurie Strode and Dr. Sam Loomis. In the original, the opening shows six-year-old Myers murder his sister Judith almost like he was possessed, and that's all we have to go on, whereas the remake shows us all of Michael's troubled childhood, some of which mirrors traits common to many prolific serial killers. We see Michael murder animals and get bullied in school, show the teacher's concern and efforts to intervene in Michael's sociopathic behaviour, his growing anger towards his family's neglect and abuse, and there are even some some incestuous implications when he goes to murder his sister. Now, as a devout believer in ambiguity and very anti let me explain every movie while disregarding the emotional point of the story, while all this information is absolutely unnecessary and contradicts Zombie's intent in making Meyer scary, as it arguably devalues the mystique as Carpenter himself explained, I do see where Zombie is coming from with his emphasis on Michael's dehumanisation. 
You see, it's not diving into the mind of Michael Myers that I find fascinating, like Carpenter, I don't care about that. It's the visual toxicity that characterizes how Michael's behavior has impacted those left baffled and victimized by his actions. It doesn't have the same raw emotional complexity as something like we need to talk about Kevin given the gratuity of zombies' exploitation influences, but with the context of the sequel, which doubles down on the preposterous symbolism, we're seeing this sort of part fantasy, part true crime inspired story about rotting innocence come full circle. There's a brief but heartbreaking scene where Michael's surviving mother Deborah shoots herself after watching old home videos of a once sweet innocent Michael before he devolved into something sinister. Regardless of whether it was nature or nurture that turned Michael violent, it still retains the reality that there just isn't a clean cut answer, and his ensuing behaviour such as being obsessed with making masks and having a fondness for the colour black leaves enough uncertainty certainty that he is still inherently creepy, but now with a tragic perpetual reminder of the child that he used to be. What is significant about this detail is that I feel it becomes directly mirrored onto his baby sister Lori, which yes, was a regretted plot point forced into the 1981 sequel simply to give Carpenter and Hill something to add to a story they felt was finished after the first film. Of course, giving Michael a motive is against the original, but here, there is this messy but meaningful spin to it that attempts to get across Lori as the one last beacon of light in Michael dark existence. In theory, Lori is the remnant of the sweet, innocent child Michael used to be, and in the 2009 sequel, it shows how she is also becoming corrupted and potentially falling down the same ambiguous evil rabbit hole as Michael. I don't even know who I am anymore. I will totally accept that I am reaching into the deep abyss to pull a justification out of this, but god damn does it really teeter on her supposedly being the glimmer of hope in a truly shitty world. However, what makes it hard to buy into this interpretation is that Lori does not project any distinct innocence to contrast her against Michael and the rest of the world. I like the symbolism on paper, but in practice, she is just an obnoxiously egotistical angsty teenager that is a far cry from the caring, brave, humble Lori in the original. The visualization is largely there, the personality just isn't. In the sequel, Zombie did specifically make an effort to address this by showing how her PTSD does lead her down a road of self-destruction, but I will come back to this later after I address Dr. Loomis. When I want your opinion, I'll beat it out of you. So, if my opinions so far haven't been too pretentious or controversial, this will likely be the turning point because... I actually think Dr. Loomis is slightly more compelling in the remakes. Alright, hang on, before y'all grab your pitchforks, let me try and explain. The brilliance of Sam Loomis in the original is that he is the one who represents the beacon of good to Michael's evil, but it's implied that in attempting to understand and help him, Loomis fell into an existential crisis of sorts and now depressively believes that the only way to stop evil is to fight fire with fire. In other words, kill Michael before he kills anyone else. Now, obviously, Zombie did not read into the character the same way I did, as according to an alleged interview with MTV, he actually felt that Loomis was more of a fear-mongering exposition dumper than a well-rounded character, which I completely disagree with. But again, let's consider this from Zombie's inverted universe. This is not Donald Pleasance's sensitive and caring Samuel Loomis. This is Malcolm McDowell's cynical and corrupted Samuel Loomis. This is old Loomis. This is new. Well, I'm not going in there until you go get me a cup of PG chips with a splash of milk, and I want it sizzling hot. In the remake, while I wouldn't say Loomis is an antagonist, he does frequently act aggressive towards Michael when he's institutionalized, and what's important about this, especially in the sequel, is that he seems responsible for reinforcing and provoking Michael's behavior. It soon becomes clear that he's basically an opportunist who sees Michael's uniqueness as a ticket to fame and fortune, which I think the 2018 reboot does also try to do with their weird perverted contrast 
Sam Loomis. While I do think Loomis does initially try to help Michael and feels a sympathetic attachment to him, over the 15 years it withers away before he ultimately gives up and essentially abandons Michael for his book, thus triggering his escape. I think you have created quite the masterpiece of a monster off the blood of this town because monsters sell books. Again, I do prefer the compassionate San Loomis, but at the same time, I'm not going to pretend that Zombie's morally conflicted approach isn't fascinating in its own right. Um, I'm not a psychic Sherlock Holmes playing Superman. Like with Laurie, his complicated personality receives a lot more attention in the sequel, where two years after the first film's events, Loomis is back in town promoting his new book, and his publicist constantly points out his tasteless exploitation to profit off a harrowing tragedy. As a result, we see Loomis become an even bigger gobshite than before, until he attempts to go through a mild redemption arc after realising he figuratively sold his soul to the devil, as the title of his own book suggests. He's even confronted by a victim's father at one of his book signings, where the man pulls a gun on him only to later reveal that it wasn't loaded, making Loomis reflect on the pain he ultimately feels a sense of suppressed responsibility for. The sequel is a very surreal and fantastical beast of a film that taps deeper into the ugliness of Zombie's reinterpretation and further solidifies that toxicity that I described Michael as spreading around him, now the characters like Loomis and Laurie have devolved into even more broken people. Going back to Lori, she's visually shown to be much edgier than before with her moody rocker look as opposed to a typical colourful suburban girl, but like I said regarding her personality in the first film, you don't see the contrast in either the dialogue or performance. The one interesting detail is when Lori begins calling herself Angel to distance herself from the Myers tragedy, acting as another symbol of the light she supposedly represents in Michael's rotting world. In the sequel, Zombie forgoes almost everything from the original, by using a heavier stylistic emphasis to get across Lori's plunge into the same psychosis as Michael, with the ending implying that Lori does reach the same point of madness as him. That's what this notorious white horse symbolism is all about. As the opening extract reads, the white horse is linked to instinct, purity, and the drive of the physical body to release powerful and emotional forces, like rage with ensuing chaos and destruction. Essentially, I think the best way to simplify Zombie's entire vision is kind of like I said earlier. Part 1 feels like a gritty true crime origin story that maintains a grim sense of serial killer realism, whereas Part 2, as the opening suggests, is more of a subconscious American McGee's Alice in Wonderland style fairy tale. One is raw and visceral, and the other attempts to be a bit more cerebral and character focused. Going from one to the other is admittedly quite jarring, especially with the change to a grainier 16mm aspect ratio, but you can definitely see how Zombie played it fairly safe the first time and then got stoned off his tits for the second one. In fact, you could almost seemingly watch the second one without having seen the first, and it will go out of its way to catch you up on the events and make an effort to reflect on them in small ways throughout the sequel. I will say, however, it does have one unforgivably frustrating sequence that compresses the 1981 sequel into the first 20 minutes, and then turns out to be a terrible nightmare. It gruesomely and barbarically hammers in the theme of rage the opening quote suggests, but honestly, I just can't bullshit a reason as to why it was a dream sequence. My best guess is either it did happen and Laurie's just replaying the events of what she can remember, or given the dreamlike symbolism of the sequel, it establishes the concept of Laurie losing touch with reality and distinguishing between what's real and what isn't. If anything, considering her therapy session takes place shortly after, it's likely just an overly long showcase of her trauma. Eh, or maybe Zombie was just pandering, I don't know, what, what, you wanna fight me? Fuck it, you tell me what happened. 
Anyway, I think I've made as much of a case for Rob Zombie's Halloween as I'm willing to before losing my own sanity. I guess my general opinion after Carpenter's original is just to follow the safe but equally effective reboot. Yet, if too much ambiguity isn't for you, and for many it won't be, Rob Zombie provides a messy, albeit inventive take on Michael Myers. It isn't going to win over those who wish to preserve the purity of the original, but if you want a brutally batshit insane and sometimes suffocating slasher flick, Rob Zombie's Halloween takes the tasteful sweetness of the spooky season and molds it into a sour and bitter monster movie.